so that he would meet you, but then if he turned away from you and was distracted, he turned back and said, oh, hello, how very nice to meet you, and mm. what's your name? We've seen that in and, the movies, 51st Dates. I remember with Adam yeah. Sandler and something like that. Okay. So to, to meet someone who had a very compromised memory, he also had absolutely no autobiographical memory. He didn't know that he was married. He had no idea where he grew up. He had no idea whether he had children and so forth. And yet, so there was this uh, whole part of himself that was lost as a result of losing these particular brain structures. And I found that to be a kind of remarkable event. And we see that elsewhere in clinical neurology, and that is that very specific, complex, sophisticated mental functions can be lost or compromised when a very specific part of brain tissue is lost. And this makes us realize in a way that was very different from how Descartes thought about it, that there are these dependencies between mental functions and brain functions and that the dependencies are so close that it motivates the hypothesis that really mental states are in fact states of the physical brain. Pat and Paul, we've got a lot of listeners who have questions for you. If you don't mind, I'll go straight to them. Stephen's calling from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Stephen, you're on the air. Hi, uh, I, I've got one uh, comment and a question. Uh, we just had a little daughter. We have a little baby daughter. Congratulations. Things, thank you very much. She's wonderful. One of the things you have to do as a new parent is learn how to calm this little crying baby. And so <laughs> no there's, there, yeah, there's, so there's basically there's a lot of tricks you do, which are basically just uh, evolutionary psychology reflexes, and it all works very well, thankfully. And there's no, you know, there's no real surprises there. You do these things, and it works because. It's, it's just reflexes and instinct. So I find it very, you know, having this little baby and going through this process, uh, I find it remarkable that anybody could think that there's any little miracles going on in, in her brain or anything that's non-physical or non-evolutionary psychology. Rock them, mind. hold them close, feed them, uh, sing yeah. something soothing, and off, off she goes. One hopes, <laughs> Stephen. Yeah, and, and, and so my question is, given, you know, just give an observation of babies and, and human beings in general. If anybody does think that there's some non-physical or miracles or magic going on in the brain, why don't, and, and, and they want to bring people to faith, as, as many faiths are called to do, why don't they devote themselves and their resources to, to demonstrating uh, any supposed miracles or magic in the, in the brain? And I would suggest one answer is because they're afraid of the answer. It would be just one more example of faith or magic to explain anything that's going on in the world. Uh, Stephen, thanks for your call. Pat, Paul, it's, it's not just uh, some purveyors of religion who would, might have questions here. It's other philosophers as well. But what about Stephen's questions? Does At this point, does anyone uh, doubt uh, in the philosophy community that it's biology at work? Well, let me just, just put it one way, and that is that, that Stephen's point is very well taken. There, So far as I know, there really is no research program that is trying to develop the dualistic hypothesis that is really looking for data and, and that really has an established and flourishing program to show that dualism is true. But the other point I wanted to make that, that will link up with Stephen's uh, point on this is, is that we have, in the last decade, learned something about what happens when uh, you have a new baby, what happens in your brain, and that is that there is a flood of oxytocin. And oxytocin is a very simple peptide, but a very important peptide. It binds to certain receptors in the front uh, part of your brain, can, and those neurons connect to neurons in the reward system. And if it all works normally, you have these powerful feelings of love. You see this child as the most beautiful thing on the earth, even though it might be sort of red and wrinkly and doesn't look appealing to anybody else. And that's oxytocin at work. Now, of course, from the inside, it feels like love and adoration. From the brain's point of view, that's mainly oxytocin doing its job. So, Paul, does that mean one day we're all going to sit around talking about oxytocin flows and I don't know how my synapses are clicking today? Does, it, does emotion become something uh, an an antique? 
uh, at least in the well, way we've that's, understood that's it? That's a wonderful question for you to pose me. Uh, I think that uh, we will come to talk about our oxytocin levels and our dopamine levels and our serotonin levels. I think we, as we learn what the neurochemistry is of a normal, healthy, emotional life, we will be seeing more accurately into the phenomena that are taking place. That will allow us, it won't take away anything from the joy and the satisfaction and the relaxation and the adoration, but it will allow us to see more accurately into the minds of other people and into the minds of babies and into the minds of those we love. Uh, if we could see more accurately what's actually going on inside each other's heads, more accurately than we currently do, then we'll be in a position to take better care of each other. We'll be in a position to see unhappiness is coming and to head them off. We'll be more skilled at pouring oil on troubled waters. Uh, I think that the, uh, the, the future of scientific knowledge here will enrich our conception of ourselves, and it'll make us better persons for it. Mm -hmm. I know there's philosophical pushback on this front. We're going to hear it in a moment from philosopher Colin McGinn, who will join us. But let me get just at least another call here. Call, Carl is calling from Boston. Hi, Carl. You're on the air. Hi. Thanks, Tom, for taking my call. Yeah. I, uh, I think the idea of the philosophy of science is very interesting. But I have a question to pose, which is, um, how do you see your role in this interdisciplinary field? Do you feel that you're there to provide questions for scientists to answer? Or do you feel that you're there more so to explain uh, the answers that scientists come up with uh, in a way that uh, is more favorable to uh, the general masses? Pat, Paul? Well, I think for different philosophers, there will be different roles. Um, in fact, I think Paul and I don't have exactly the same role either. But part of what I see myself as doing is playing a kind of synthetic role where I have the luxury, because I'm not an experimental scientist, of roving across many, many subfields of psychology and neuroscience and sort of pulling things together in an interesting way. So that, for example, right now I'm deeply interested in the nature of moral behavior, which means that I get lots of help from uh, research in psychology, but also the story of oxytocin and vasopressin and monogamous pair bonding, and, but also from evolutionary biology and the animal um, behavior people. So that's how I see myself. But other philosophers can do other things. I mean, there's many things to do. I think the, the, what you don't want to do is sort of insist that, that conceptual analysis where you sit in the armchair and keep all science at bay, I think that's probably a dead end. Mm. There's the rub, and we'll talk about that. Let me get another call from Hilton Head, South Carolina. Stephanie is on the line. Hi, Stephanie. You're on the air. Hi, Tom. Thanks for taking my call. You're I'm just calling um, because I have spent my whole life being interested in all of these things that you're talking about. And I'm 35, and I just found out that I have attention deficit disorder and obsessive compulsive disorder. Okay. And so I'm finally understanding why I've been obsessed my whole life with trying to figure out why I do <laughs> what I do and not being able to accomplish everything I'm wanting to do. Humans obsessed I, since time immemorial, and you maybe maybe more than most. <laughs> yes, exactly, and yet my ADD makes me wander too much. Um, I'm just finishing my doctorate in physical therapy and want to specialize in neurological disorders, and I think this is because I've been trying to incorporate philosophy and neuroscience and everything and, and uh, biology. So what's your question for the church lens, Stephanie? What's your question today? Well, my question today is, well, I guess it was just a comment, just to say that I'm so excited to hear what they're talking about, because I really think it's where I've come to in my own evolved thinking of understanding brain mm. functioning and not functioning perfectly. <laughs> so I guess that's my comment. Uh, Stephanie, thanks very much for that. Paul, uh, Pat, a response? Hers is a heartening comment. Uh, if uh, she now has a feeling of control or power, uh, and more than a feeling, maybe she has some actual control and some actual power over her condition because she's learned some of the uh, uh, theory of uh, uh, how the brain works and how it uh, doesn't work, then, uh, well... Oh. Good for her. She'll probably do better uh, having demystified what was a mystery.